Hello and welcome. It's another Friday. You're tuned into the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. I'm your host, Dave Schrader. Listen, it's the season, right? We've been talking about the uh, holidays. We had Jeff Belanger on a few weeks ago talking about some of the creepy critters and creatures involved around the original histories of Christmas. And we wanted to uh, continue this little journey. We've got a brand new theater of the mind. It's a a really kind of interesting, I thought, fun, interesting story from um, my life again. It is a... Uh, miracle story, if you will, an angel intervention story, which I thought would fit kind of into the the season feelings we're doing with these shows. But joining us today, uh, it's been about four years since we've had her on. She's here to talk to us and and share some insights with her book. Linda Radish writes and lectures on a wide variety of arcane topics. She's a longtime library and uh, employee and professional craft instructor who teaches classes on candle making, broom making, and other old time homemaking arts. She lives in New Jersey, and her book is called The Old Magic of Christmas Yuletide Traditions for the Darkest Days of the Year. Linda, it's great to visit with you again. Thank you for coming on today. Yeah, it's good to be back with you. Let's uh, let's jump into this again for people that aren't familiar with you and and your work and you've done uh, quite a few books very interesting topics like this what made you start to look into the weirder side of this season what what was the the draw to you for that I think the the original impetus was seeing um box of delights the BBC version of this old Christmas children's novel called the box of delights on public television when I was a teenager, and it was Christmassy. It was filled with, you know, a Christmas thing, and it took place at Christmas time, but it had all these crazy things going on. There were werewolves. There was an odd woman in a plaid shawl who was uh, saying um, the wolves are running. There was her and the hunter was making cameo appearances, and that was a huge epiphany for me. No, well, yes, maybe pun in- seasonal pun intended. That like, wow, Christmas is Christmas has a spooky, mystical, pagan angle, and um, that was in the days before the internet. So it wasn't easy to find out. You know, you can just look up Hern the Hunter. There were not a lot of books that you could pick up and find about Hern the Hunter and and you know, history of werewolves. Uh, so it, it would kind of percolated in the back of my mind. And you, when you started looking into this, I mean, did you have any idea of of really this kind of background of this season and what was all involved? No, no, not the whole thing. I did, when I was in a freshman in college, I did a paper on solstice tra- traditions, and I came across um, mummers and sword dances and some Nordic rituals. Didn't really get that deep into it, um, and then as in my 20s, there was an article in Smithsonian Magazine when I was, back when I was working in the library, that had black and white photos of Bavarian traditions, and that's how I discovered the Butenmandel. There was this picture of a person, a human, dressed as a giant sheaf of wheat with a belt of huge cowbells around his waist, and I actually used that as my Christmas card card image that year. So it just kind of kept... What was his name? The, the, the Bootenmandel. The Bootenmandel. It's translated riddle, riddle Rattle Man, but it really means Little Booten Man, but he's not, big at, he's not little at all. He's quite big. And they come out in the town of Berchtesgaden in Bavaria on December 6th, and they run through town, and they chase the girls. And then they go back up into the mountains. And they're local local boys, local teenage boys dressed up like this. It's an old, old fertility ritual. And uh, they're sort of like the vanguard for St. Nicholas, who then comes and asks the children if they've been good and passes out treats. Uh, so, yeah, he looks cool. That's cool. I've never even heard of the Booten 
Bootenmandel, oh, the, the Riddle Rattle Man. I like that better. I, I didn't need to, we've been talking about cool horror movies for the holidays, and the, the Riddle Rattle Man sounds like it's right up the Jingle Balls alley for that kind of thing. Um, I think so. What, what, what was his genesis? You, I mean, what was the whole purpose behind him? He was just supposed to come scare well, off the so bad he kids? Had a, uh, no, no, it was fertility. Cause, um, oh, fertility. He had, they, yeah, they have whips. Okay, they're dressed as sheaves of wheat. Um, they have whips, and they run after girls. Like, if there's a girl that you like in the village, she's the one that you're going to run after, and you're going to try to, like, bowl her over in the snow. You're going to try to kiss her and then run away again. And I think it leads to some awkward situations, because I've watched YouTube videos of of the ritual in action, and there seems that the teenagers look uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah I wonder why. And they're doing <laughs> yeah. And dressed as a chef of wheat, you're not really in your best look in that point, I would guess. No, and well, the thing is, she doesn't know who you are. The girl, you know who the girl is because she's dressed in her everyday clothes, but the girls don't necessarily know who the guys are. Gotcha. And yeah. you're hoping to kind of, yeah. are you kind of hoping to plant like a, a seed of love? And I don't mean that in the uh, poetic or pun-like version I'm talking about, but is that kind of the idea of giving them a little kiss? Is that the, uh, hopefully when you come so. back down, things are good? In the old days, they might have said, hey, let's uh, let's take this over to the barn. I don't know. <laughs> let's take this they, over to the know, barn. It's highly ritualized, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so this was, uh, this was a season for um, uh, creating new life then, I guess, as well. Yeah, because I guess you got to plant the seeds for for the next day. But they do; they look scary because they're because they have the, they're dressed dressed in these huge sheaves of wheat. Um, they make a lot of noise with these rattling cowbells around their their waist. So they do look scary. All right, and now well, they, they just come down. Away. Yeah, they could be scaring away the evil spirits, right? Isn't that what rattling noises yeah, and, I, and and the evil spirits they get in the way of fertility? So I guess scare away the evil spirits and and make way for a fruitful year next year. Very cool. All right, yeah. Well, see, that's what's so fascinating to me about this: how there are so many of these weird um, kind of festive things that are done around the world, and why they do these type of things. What is what's the point in in doing this? And I, obviously, they have no ties to the actual season of Christmas itself, right? Because some of these predate that whole the theory and creation well it's 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 hard to say because it's gotten so you know if you plant two trees side by side the roots are going to get tangled up sometimes the the trunks are going to entwine and then you have a whole new thing so some of the traditions yes you can clearly predate christianity others are clearly christian but sometimes you take one you're like oh that's got to be christian and it turns out to be have more on the pagan side, and sometimes you say, oh, that's got to be pagan, and it's actually a Christian invention. Like yesterday was uh, St. Lucy's Day, which is celebrated biggest in Sweden. Have you ever seen the, the Lucia? It's, it's usually a girl. It wasn't always a girl. Now it's sometimes a boy, again. Um, but she wears like a white nightgown, a red sash, and she had, has a crown of candles on her head. You ever seen that? Right. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that kind of yeah, that kind yeah, of image yeah. before, sure. And it's on December thirteenth, which um there's the two calendars, the Julian, we're now in the Gregorian, but when it was the Julian calendar, the the winter solstice would fall on December thirteenth, so that was the darkest day of the year. So you've got this girl with a crown of candles and you're like, Well, that's gotta be a solstice ritual and she's got the red sass, so probably they're gonna, you know, she's gonna bring the light and then they're gonna sacrifice her. But she actually didn't come around until the 1800s, and she was inspired by the German representation of the Christ child, which was played by a girl, and she often had a crown of candles on her head. And the Christ child was the reaction against the cult of St. Nicholas when Protestantism came around. They said, oh, well, you're not supposed to worship a saint. We can't have this saint going around giving presents, so we'll have the Christ child him slash herself, give out the presents instead. Now, was the idea of the, the kind of um, wreath of candles around the head, was that trying to convey the halo effect? Yeah. The lighted yeah. circle around the head of Jesus or, or the spirits? I think so, yeah, because and, and, and it looks really cool um, if you're careful with it. Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. But I, then if you go back further, mm-hmm. you have Lucy figures in both. So there was a Saint Lucy who she gouged her eyes out so that she didn't have to get married. Um, it's a gory, gory story. So there's an early Christian martyr Saint Lucy, but there are um, medieval representations and into the 1800s sometimes of a Lucy figure who appeared on December 13th, St. Lucy's Day, and was a witch. So actually, the, 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 the Santa Lucia in Sweden, is she's very cleaned up. She's a very cleaned up version, <laughs> inspired by the Christ child. So, so you see how it just goes. Right. Everybody has kind of a different it's variation and version of it. And, and it just, like, it's one tradition influencing another tradition, and then the old tradition comes out and back around again. So it's, it's A, it's hard to sort out, and B, it's, okay, it's fun to sort out, but um, to say, like, well, we have to strip all the pagan elements out so we can have a Christian Christmas, or strip all the Christian elements out so we can have a pagan solstice, I like the richness of everything mixed up together. Which is what Christmas seems to have really become, right? I mean, we celebrate many of these different aspects, but, you know, we just call them different things to kind of coincide with our own belief systems. Yeah, to accentuate what what you want to. And in Japan, they love Christmas in Japan. They've taken the whole, you know, the whole package, and it's been long enough now that actually Japan, even though... Probably 99% of the people celebrating Christmas in Japan are not Christian. They, they've they given it their own flavor in Japan now. There's things that they do in Japan on Christmas that I don't know if they think we do these things, but we don't, but they do them, and that's become the Japanese Christmas. So it's a highly, we've come up with something good here, and it's even exportable, and everybody's putting a new spin on it. Yeah, I was going to say, I bet Japan and China both love uh, Christmas, because we're buying and exporting and importing constantly from them for that kind of stuff. True. <laughs> no, they just like it, um, in, at least in Japan. I don't know about China. I don't know what kind of status Christmas has in China. But in Japan, you, you go and get a special um, an angel food cake with matsupon figures on top, and... For them, Christmas Eve is a romantic time. Like on all the soap operas, the Japanese soap operas, the Christmas Eve episode is, you know, they're all wandering around, you know, characters who've just broken up wandering around town, lonely and sad and crying at Christmas trees. Really? Well, that's kind of an interesting yeah. aspect of this whole deal. And in, I know, right? In, in your book, yeah. you kind of break it out even further that this whole kind of the calendar of Christmas spirits and spells starts around mid-October and goes through into January, correct? This It's not just the, the 12 yeah. days of Christmas. It's not just, you know, one month or, or a few days within the month. But this thing starts in mid-October and then it kind does. of and continues of, to roll through. A lot of the things that we do... On Halloween now, they used to be doing that at Christmas. Oh, I didn't know that, really. So that's kind of a rollover from a pagan... Well, that was kind of a pagan ritual for the carving of the, the turnips and things like that anyway, wasn't it? Yeah, they were, do, they were doing things on, on Halloween, too. Um, but like the telling of ghost stories, that was even in Dickens' time. And Dickens has a whole volume of Christmas ghost stories. That was a Christmas thing. Gotcha. Now, um, more than more than at Halloween. And starting, let's go back into like November, starting around the eleventh. That's Saint Martin's Day. So, yes. kind of why I'm going to just hit you with some of these different days. Kind of give me some of the background on where these started from. First of all, this guy is a guy everybody's going to like, right? He walks around turning your glass of water into wine at night, so you got a little surprise when you wake up. But uh, tell me yeah. a little bit about Saint Martin and where that all started. There were there were two Saint Martins. One was a bishop, and one was a Roman soldier. And I think it was the Roman soldier. Who, the story goes he met um, Christ on the road, and Christ had no cloak, so he cut his cloak in half and gave him half of it. And then, of course, after you do something like that, you become a saint. Um, and he had on Saint Martin's Day there were uh, the Pelts Martin, the Fur Martin. Um, guys dressed in furs would come out with the whips and the bells to do 
throw out treats or bestow blessings. So, and they, um, they're one of the very St. Nicholas or Bell's Nickel like figures. You've got these little furry figures. So that's the earliest of, of their appearances in the year. There's also then the furry Nicholas, furry Nicks, and which contribute to the image of Santa Claus because the first, the earliest images in America of Santa Claus, he's dressed in fur. Right. And that was because coming over from Germany, the, the furry Nicholases. So that was his traveling clothes to keep warm during that tr- trip, right? <laughs> that trek, yes, yes. And but they they sell, uh, celebrate a lot of saints throughout the the religious days, don't they? And and what each one brings is is there a specific reason that these saints are picked for these days and why they do what they do? Because you've got what the Saint Catherine's Eve, Saint Andrew's Eve, uh, Saint Barbara's Eve, Saint Nicholas Eve, and those are just you know between November twenty fourth and December fifth. That seems like a lot of different visitations and a lot of different things going on. Well, you've got a saint for every day. I think you've got a saint every day of the year because in the Middle Ages you would be named. Your parents didn't have to pick out a name for you. You would just be named for the saint on whose day you were born. Oh, I didn't know that. Probably. Yeah, yeah, and they in in Scandinavia they still have, at least in Sweden they still have name days. You'll have your birthday, and then you'll have your name day, which is that saint's. You know, if your if your name is Catherine, then Saint Catherine's Day is your name day, even though they're mostly Protestant up there now. So I think it's more surprising. The question is why don't we celebrate so many saints at other times of the year? And it's I think it's because this time of year in an agricultural society was important in starting in the fall. You do the slaughtering, the salting, the soap and candle making, make sure you, you get all ready for the winter, and then try to, you know, create some good magic to make sure that uh, you ensure fertility for the next year. So that's when you have to have, uh, you've got to have these rituals, um, but once everybody converted to Christianity, you had to do it under a, under the guise of a saint. So uh, all these different characters who come sweeping through the town, either with brooms or carpet beaters or cowbells, were renamed in honor of the saint. Because as I said, the, the, even the Butenmandel, they were the vanguard for St. Nicholas. And the, the Baborki in Bohemia, in Czech Republic, they're on, they come out on St. Barbara's Day and... Uh, they knock their brooms and their carpet beaters against the window, and then they come in and hand out treats. See, they're giving and, some really distracting messages, right? Because you've got kind of creepy-looking figures rattling bells and chains, dressed kind of eerily and creepily and doing some weird stuff, but then it seems like they're out rewarding you. But then you get closer to Christmas, and you've got you know, guys like the Belschnickel and Krampus and Black Peter, and you've got some really nasty guys who they're kind of dressed similarly, but they they seem to have a much more notorious um, or, or nefarious plan in mind for the children. That's got to be confusing for these different uh, realms. But I want to I want to stop in on this one because uh, uh, November 29th, St. Andrew's Eve, this has also a tie to uh, kind of vampire culture, correct? Yeah, every, everybody loves the vampires. I almost didn't put that one in because I really don't like vampires, but I thought, well, it's got to be in there. Um, yeah, that's when the vampires would come out. Um, I think because, well... I know it's associated with crossroads. This is the, it's a, a crossroads of the year. Because the season is changing from fall to winter. And also St. Andrew supposedly was, was martyred on a, an X shaped cross. And so there were freaky things happening at the crossroads as they often do throughout the year. And one of the things was the, the uh, vampires would come out and they weren't necessarily bad vampires. Sometimes they would just go, they were incorporeal vampires who would just go and battle the, the vampires in the next village over. <laughs> so it was, it was uh, gang warfare? <laughs> Drive-by drive drive bitings? Like <laughs> more like a softball team, you know? <laughs> Supernatural <laughs> softball team. Hey, we won. What, what's the Bleigeisen kit? Am I saying that right? Uh, Bleigeisen. Bleigeisen. Yeah, I, I told it it's no longer legal. You can't buy those kits anymore because it's lead where you heat lead 
in the fireplace so it's hot, and then you take a ladle and you drop the molten lead into cold water, and depending on what shape it takes, that tells you something about what's going to happen to you in the next year. If it's shaped like a car, you're going to get a car next year. If it's shaped like, I don't know, a jail cell, then maybe you're... If it, of course, it's shaped <laughs> like a coffin, then you know you're going to die. A lot of this was to find out who was going to die in the coming year. I don't think I would want to know that. And the Romanian vampires, the Strigoi, that was kind of their night to come out in force. Right? And on it, November 30th? Uh, yeah, November 29th, I think, on St. Andrew's night, right? Isn't that what they uh, did? Yeah. And then, and that's kind of where the tradition of garlic came in, for, you know, with the whole tie. Yeah, they did to, to uh, do the door, the door frames and uh, the door jams in garlic to prevent them from coming in. But there, in, the vampire that, like, our Bram Stoker vampire is large, largely the invention of Bram Stoker. Right. Before that, they were more they were either incorporeal or they were in some cases I think the earliest vampires were very similar to werewolves and they may have come into Romania from Turkey. It may have originally been a Turkish tradition that was taken over. I didn't know that. That's interesting. So that that's just kind of a but isn't that a weird aspect? All of these weird creepy crawlers kind of coming out from Halloween on all leading up to St. Nicholas, to, to Santa Claus's visit. It's almost like they get the run of the, the planet for those days until Santa Claus kind of comes in and cleans the way after that. And But then there's even weird rituals that take place after that. Um, St. Nicholas in... in I remember it's getting, it's getting darker and darker. Right. So, so because it's getting it's darker, getting more... Out. Right. So that when it's darker earlier, that's giving them kind of free reign to do their stuff. Yeah, and then after the the winter solstice, the days start getting longer, and things turn to, to our favor. Now I've I've heard but of then Ad- you have the end of, Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Ad- then, I was then then you have the end of the year, and because it's the end of the year, whenever you have like a, a boundary, then that gets dangerous again for the twelve days of Christmas from the twenty fifth until January sixth, because just because it's at the border. Well, we'll have to work our way to that. Talk to me. I've heard of Advent calendars, but what what are Advent oh, Thursdays? Had one? No, I never had one. I, you know, I grew up a a, a poor white child in uh, Medina, Illinois. <laughs> we were oh, Lutherans. Well, I grew up a, we didn't have well, uh, Advent. Class, <laughs> um, in New Jersey, but my mother always made sure that we had Advent calendars. We had, my kids are spoiled. I always had the paper Advent calendar. Um, but at least my youngest daughter, she insists on the one that has a piece of chocolate behind each door. Oh, right. Yeah, that's the one I've, I've seen and, and dreamt about in movies. That's the magical Advent calendar, right, that uh, you get a little treat every day uh, for that. But what are Advent Thursdays? Advent Thursdays are in mostly in parts of Germany, and that's when um, you had just ordinary neighborhood kids would go around... Um, rattling things and banging on pots and generally scaring away evil spirits. And it may have been on Thursday because Friday is named for the goddess Frigga. So so Thursday was Frigga's Eve. And there were all kinds of prohibitions for that, like you have to have your spinning done, you shouldn't spin on, on Frigga's Eve. And um sometimes she has she comes in like lots of forms um Bertha Perchta she's kind of intertwined with the Italian witch Bafana and sometimes she has a whole retinue of uh infant ghosts and goblins so it could be to scare her away or it could be these kids are acting on on Frigga's behalf in bestowing blessings so they almost it, maybe these little creatures aren't as terrifying as we thought. That was just their that was their like minions, if you will, that that went along with them yeah. on these trips. But they, it was also you. What was it that during that time it was a, a season of of abstinence, right? You you weren't supposed to have sex during any of the Advent, right? Because if you had sex during Advent, then your kid might be born a werewolf. And they were born in September. <laughs> 
Really? Uh, How did that, where, why did the leap to werewolf come in? How did that, do we know any history on, on, on? There's also, um, like my older daughter, she could have been a werewolf. She was born on December 26th. If you're born during the 12 days of Christmas also, you run a higher risk of becoming a werewolf. I guess they, I don't know, some people had, as we know, it's a, it's a genuine um, psychological condition. Or it used to, No, I think it is. I think there are still, um, what do they call them, lycanthropists. Right. People who do actually believe that they are werewolves. And I guess, you know, and especially, I guess you're going to have more of them in a society that actually believes in werewolves. And I guess they were looking for some explanation, you know, because you always want to point the figure at mom. Right. It's mom's fault. What did mom do? Oh, she had sex during Advent. No, the women, they're always taking the heat for the stupid stuff that goes on, right? Yes. <laughs> but you've There's got... actually a really good I... um, book of, series of children's books by Mary Rose Wood. It's called The, the Incorrigible Children of Ashton Place that has this subplot where the the lords of the manor at least believe that they are werewolves, and it's they're very funny books, but they're you know this this ongoing mystery in the family of the eldest son always becoming a werewolf. That's great, boy. There so you've got vampires, werewolves, witches involved with this. This is and that's a totally different aspect of this whole thing. I had no clue that this is where they all you know this is where a lot of these these beliefs spawn from. Now. Sweden has got kind of an interesting deal with St. Anne's Day, and I think you, you started to touch on that. But kind of tell me, tell me about some of the weird traditions they do on St. Anne's Day. Um, was, was it Sweden or was it Finland? Well, Sweden is when you have to start soaking your codfish if it's going to be edible by Christmas Eve. Right, but that's a it. long soak from December 9th to the twenty fourth. <laughs> it's well because it's like hard as a rock. I've never made it. But, okay. <laughs> um, we have a Scandinavian fair every year um, in our town, and uh, there's like all kinds of T-shirts and things and jokes about the lutefisk. Right. Yeah, I, I'm in Minnesota. We have the lutefisk in Minnesota. We must know. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> it's a. It's like a fish that's caked in lye and every other horrible substance on the planet, and you're supposed to eat it. No, thank you. Yeah, you have to. You've got to soak it to get that lye out of it. Right. You know, I, I make soap, and when you add the water to the lye, you have to leave. You have to open all the windows and leave the room for a while because you can't be there while it's active. So you don't want to be ingesting lye. You want to soak it all out. And well, and, and we've all heard stories of the magical creatures, right? I mean, you've got flying reindeer, that's sweet. You've got elves, you've got this. But there's also a Swedish Yule boar. Yeah. <laughs> and a boar, and sometimes the creepiest version is there's a, a, a sow, a female pig, and she will float by. You're supposed to leave out offerings. This was, I don't think anybody's doing this anymore. And if you didn't leave out sufficient offerings, she would come and haunt the underside of the dining room table and would just be there glowering with ill intentions. And then there's also a strange association with pigs and abandoned babies. My guess is that a, a piglet is a little bit like the newborn baby they're you know pink and smooth and always hungry kind of cute in a nice way. <laughs> always right. hungry and in fact even in the Faroe Islands there's a special kind of ghost whose name literally translates as pig from below and that's the ghost of an abandoned baby that was abandoned at birth and who usually comes back to haunt the family you know if mom's getting remarried or if one of the other kids who wasn't abandoned is is um, having a wedding. They'll come and they'll be quite angry that, hey, what about me? Wow, what strange traditions. And on, on St. Lucy's Eve, there are these balls of dancing lights. And what are they meant to be? Are they are they the the spirits of our of our elders and our, our family members visiting? What do we know about that? In the case of a Lutzi shine, they seem to be 
like men, b- boys in, in Austria would stay up late and watch for them. I mean, if you, if they had some kind of prophetic but you know they've got balls of light we have balls of light everywhere i've heard about stories of balls of light in new mexico and so i don't know what they are but they would just the the whole idea was to witness them and see them i wonder if that's kind of where the idea of of watching for like rudolph's glowing nose came from is the idea that at night you would go out and watch the skies for this light source these weird Uh, balls of dancing light yeah but no rudolph no because rudolph goes back to like what 1930 right yeah with uh what gene Rudolph autry wholesale, yeah, <laughs> wholesale invention it was some guy who what? his wife was sick and he yeah it was he was he, his wife was sick he wasn't making much money and he wrote a like a little story about rudolph and then johnny marks wrote the music to the song and i think macy's had a copyright on it for a while the guy who wrote the original story he never got much money out of it, but yeah, Rudolph is is a twentieth twentieth century. Yeah, American but you wonder if, if if that kind of that kind of story inspired him for that, right? Because people would go out and look for these balls of light. I I'm gonna say no. Interesting. Well, it's weird though that he would come up with the fact that there's a light lighting the way for Santa, and in some of these cultures, that would be what they were looking for. Well, these balls of dancing light. Yeah, just an interesting little deal. Who are the Who are the Yule lads? Oh, they're in Iceland, and their parents are trolls, so they're trolls. Um, they're they become nicer than their parents. Their parents eat kids. These trolls don't actually eat kids. There's um. Twelve of them, I believe, and they come and they might like make some noise. They come one by one in the the twelve days leading up to Christmas, and uh, down from the mountains into town, and they might, you know, like steal the yogurt and play tricks on the cat and just generally create mischief. Um, and then after Christmas, they one by one they go back back up into the mountains again but now i've heard i have a friend who he leads tours in iceland and they're more they've been very prettified they've been niceified and they're just kind of cute and more like little santa clauses but they did start out they have troll blood this man what a and every time i start thinking we're strange here in the united states i, I hear stories like this um, I know you've got a you got a weird little uh, riff, and I want to bounce back to this for a second in the book talking about witches bearing gifts. And there was a time when it was considered godly to walk around in a flea infested hair shirt. What the hell is a hair shirt? A hair is made out of it's made out of horse hair. It's woven from horse hair instead of something nice and soft, so you can be all itchy and penitent under your clothes and get to heaven faster. Oh, so that was the the penitent way of doing. It. So instead of flogging yeah, yourself, was, or or that you would have to wear an itchy uh, horsehide shirt filled with with uh, fleas. Yeah, not not horsehide. It was woven out of horse hair. Oh, horse hair. Okay. Some you know monks would wear it, and if you, if you've done something really bad, um, the priest might tell you, "Well, you have to wear a hair shirt for a month, and that will atone for your sins." And, and the, of course, nobody bathed. Bathed was considered. Unholy. I thought cleansliness was next to godliness. No, not no. that's like uh, starting in the 1800s. Before so that, that was... it was you should stay dirty a because it's you know vain to bathe yourself and also very dangerous if you you need those pores to stay clogged and sealed so no no evil influences can penetrate your body. Oh, gross. What a stinky, weird time. I like how in the book you said cleansliness was next to witchiness, and there was an Italian witch, Bafana? Yes. Right, and she, what, she would fly over rooftops looking for the baby Jesus? Yeah, because she was cleaning house one day when the wise men came by and asked for directions, and then, then they asked, did, did she want to come with them to give a gift to this really special baby that's being born under the star? And she said, no, I'm too busy. I have to clean. I guess she was, you know, your typical good Italian housewife. But then later <laughs> she had second thoughts. She put down her broom. She ran after them, but she couldn't find them. So she's been looking for the baby Jesus ever since. So she just 
on on Epiphany, and that's where her name comes from. Epiphania became Befana. So she just drops toys down the chimney of any house where there's a kid, just in case that kid happens to be the baby Jesus. So there's a, a, there's a Christmas witch who also delivers toys. No wonder. See, now, now the truth is coming out. Linda, is the fact that Santa really doesn't hit up all these. He's just got a bunch of, of workers out hitting. He's got witches. He's got creatures. He's got everybody out doing his bidding for him. But, well, he's been, Santa has been edging out all these other gift givers. Like, it used to be um, a goat in Scandinavia that brought the gift, and then it was a nith, which is a sort of elf gnome-like creature, an elf on a goat, and then it was just the elf, and now it's Santa bringing. And, like, you don't see Bafana that much in Italy anymore. I, there's a, a lot of Italian-Americans where I live, and some of them, yeah, they say they know, they know about Bafana and they had school plays with Bafana in them. Um, but Santa's really, uh, he's edging a lot of them out. So I'm kind of happy that Krampus has risen up the way he is, he has, to uh, sort of, like... Say, hey, no, stop Santa in his tracks. <laughs> well, no, he's working with Santa, too. That's Krampus's job, to kind of clear out the, the ruffians so Santa has an easier job. That's why I said I think Santa might right. be, he's like a mob boss. He has all these other people that were doing the hard work, and then he just kind of co- came in and took over the uh, the the uh, fame of it all. Uh, let's do this. We have to take a break. Before we do that, though, it's time for a brand new edition of Theater of the Mind. For my own dark hives, this is the savior of the rest stop. It was the summer of 1988. I had just become a father for the very first time. I'd been pretty rudderless with no direction and no idea of what I wanted to do as an adult, so I decided to look into schooling again. I was able to acquire an ACT testing program through Winona State College, but I had to get up there, take the test, pass the test in order to be accepted into the college. I set out with my very meager amount of money that I had and drove my 1969 Plymouth Fury from Chicago, Illinois to Winona, Minnesota. Now, let me just preface this by saying I'm not a car guy. I think I've made that pretty clear throughout my life on the radio show. I know where to put the key. I most of the time know where to put the gas. And I know how to push a pedal and move forward. And that's about the extent of my knowledge of vehicles. With that said, I'd set out on my six and a half hour journey and have been driving along for quite a while. Now I'm more of a nighttime driver. I like the cool, crisp air. I like the dark. I don't really like sunlight and being basked in it. So I leave at evening time so that I would have a little bit more time to drive there, have less traffic. And I'm motoring along the highway, enjoying myself, listening to the radio and almost being hypnotized by that rhythmic sound of the wheels against the pavement thinking of my bright new future and all it took was to pass this ACT test. I was only a day away from opening up a whole new future for myself. I continued to drive along my journey when I felt something weird shift. My wheel jerked slightly and the car began to make a thunking sound. Then, much to my dismay, from beneath my hood, I saw white steam begin to rise. At this place, I had just come upon Portage, Wisconsin. Off to my left was the Cascade Mountain Ski Slopes. Of course, this time of year, not very busy because it's midsummer. But I limped off the highway to a rest stop not too far away. It's nighttime at this point, probably a good 10, 1030 at night, if not a little bit later. I pull into the rest stop and get as close to the little bathroom hut as I can so I can utilize what little light there is. And then I step out of my car. I pop the hood, and I stand there, bewildered. Not being much of a mechanic or car guy, I had no clue what was going on. I guess I was just hoping something would start blinking and draw my attention to the problem that I could quickly MacGyver my way out of by putting a piece of gum and and duct tape on (laughs) to get myself to my eventual location. But there was nothing. All I could see was steam and a hissing sound from my car. I stood there downtrodden, my head hanging low. I scanned the entire parking lot. There was just one old rusted blue car, about five or six parking spaces down from me, but not a soul to be seen anywhere in sight. I went back to looking underneath the hood, hoping against all hopes to get some indication of what I could do to fix this mess I was in. When suddenly I heard from the woods, 
Hey! Hey, everything okay over there? I looked beyond my hood, and there, coming out of the woods, was a dirty hippie. I don't know how else to explain it. He had long Jesus-like hair and a long Jesus beard. He was wearing a dirty t-shirt and jeans and no shoes or socks, just strolling across the old rest stop area. I looked next to me, and there was a fully functioning restroom, so I'm sure he wasn't in the restroom going to the bathroom. I couldn't figure out what he was doing, though. He came strolling casually up to my car, outstretched his grimy hand, gave me a smile, and said, What's going on, man? I don't know. I I don't know what's going on. I'm trying to drive to college. I have to take an ACT test in the morning to get admitted to Winona State College. Oh, congratulations, man. That's really cool. Well, what happened? So I explained to him the rattling, the banging, the jerk of the wheel, and steam pouring out from underneath my hood. Once it cooled down enough that he could get a good look, he quickly determined that the flugelhopper had blown. Now I'm going to call it a flugelhopper because as I'm pounding the the, uh, story to you, I, I can't remember what it's called and I'm not a car guy, so even if I knew what it was, I would probably mess it up anyway. But he looks at me confidently and says, oh man, you need a flugelhopper. And I looked at him and I said, yeah, well, where am I going to get a flugelhopper at this time of night? He gave me a knowing nod and a wink and started padding off across the parking lot to his car. He suddenly popped the trunk of his car, reached in, grabbed what appeared to be an old, heavy, but small toolkit from inside his trunk. He carried it across the parking lot to me and with a knowing glance and smile again said, let's see what we have here. He popped open the toolkit, gave it a cursory glance, moved a few trays, shuffled a few things, and lo and behold, there was a small plastic bag in the bottom. And inside was a little black rubber stoppery looking thing. And he said, ah, a flugelhopper. I was astonished. I mean, what are the odds that I would blow a flugelhopper in the middle of nowhere, Wisconsin, pull into a restaurant where there's only one rusted out old car and one dirty barefoot hippie climbing around in the woods and he would happen to have a flugelhopper for a 1969 Plymouth Fury. Wow, are are these common? No, I don't even know where I got this. That's all he could tell me. He pulled it out of the bag, reached down, slid it over what appeared to be a small hose or, or spout. Then he sat up, smiled at me and said, there you go, man. You should be good to go. All you need to do is pour some cool water in your radiator once you get going, and you'll be fine for the rest of your ride, and it should get you back to Illinois, but I'd get that checked when you get home. Well, thanks a lot, man. I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. I'm a new father. I left my job so I could try to get into college. I wish I had something to pay you. I I have nothing. I have enough money to get myself to college, pay for my meal, pay for the test, and get back home. He stopped and gave me a long, thoughtful stare. He scratched his chin, and then he pointed his finger at me, and he said, I'll tell you what, we'll call it even, but you do me a favor. At this point, I started to feel a little uncomfortable. I was now realizing I'm in the middle of nowhere, in a wooded area, with a dirty, shoeless hippie who's hanging out in the woods, and I had heard about what had happened at truck stops and rest stops around the area before. Well, I I don't know, and he said, you just pay it forward just do something nice for someone else. That's all I'll ever ask of you. Well, yeah, I can do that. He said, make sure you're going to do it. I said, I'll definitely do it. With that, he turned, replaced his toolkit into his trunk, shut the trunk, and wandered off back into the woods where I never saw him again. Eventually, my engine cooled down. I found an old bucket and I was able to fill it with some water. Then I slowly poured it into my radiator till it filled, got in behind my car, turned on the ignition, and to my happiness, the engine fired up with just a little to follow along. But it was working. I knew I wasn't too much further from Winona. I eased my way back out onto the highway very slowly so that I wouldn't blow my flugelhopper again because everybody knows you don't want your flugelhopper blown twice in the same night. I slowly drove myself to school, where I arrived a few hours later. The whole time pondering, where did this dirty Jesus hippie come from? How did he have exactly what I needed in his rinky-dink little toolkit? It didn't make sense to me. 
But I thought it was fascinating that of all the things he asked, this Jesus-looking character who appeared out of nowhere to help me get back on my way just asked one simple favor. Do something nice for someone else. Well, it didn't take long for that to happen. As a matter of fact, as I was sitting there that morning, I had a bag with a couple of Egg McMuffins in it and a cup of coffee getting ready to take my ACT test. There was another kid that was off to the side and a guy that looked slightly older than me leaning against the wall. We were all there waiting for them to open the doors to let us in for the ACT. The kid off to my side that looked nervous and uncomfortable said, hey, everything okay? He said, yeah, man, I just didn't have time to eat this morning. I'm nervous about this test. I just don't know where I'm going to go. And I said, well, here, I've got an extra Egg McMuffin if you'd like it. Really? Oh, that'd be great. Thanks a lot. So I handed him the Egg McMuffin, to which he quickly annihilated it, and he wandered off. Now, the guy that looked just slightly older than me walked over and started small talk with me. Asked me my name, where I was from, what I was doing there. Said, well, I'm here for the ACT test, to which he reported, I am too. We began talking about it, and I told him my story. I was a new father. I'd been out of high school since 1985. I wasn't even sure I was going to be able to pass the ACT, as I hadn't studied. This was just a quick decision, and there was a very limited window to take this test to get into college. He nodded and wished me luck. I told him the one point of the entire test that unnerved me most was going to be the math test. I told him I just wasn't good at math. Math to me was like reading foreign languages. Even the simplest math equations, I just can't wrap my head around. It takes me a while. He even mentioned it might be a form of dyslexia. Well, the room began to fill with more and more people. And I said, well, I'm just going to have to do my very best. He said, I'm sure you're going to do just fine. He then stood up walked over to the door and unlocked it. He was our instructor. We all walked in and took positions at the table. He went over the rules of how to take the test and began handing us out tests. Each test, A, B, A, B, so that none of us sitting next to each other had a matching test. As we progressed through the afternoon, taking our tests in the time that we were allowed, finally, we came to the math portion of the test. And I began to break a sweat. My stomach hurt so bad, all I could see was my entire future in front of me starting to crumble away because I knew this would be the problem. And as the instructor passed out that paperwork to everyone around the room, he came up next to me and he said, Huh, seems all I have are two of the exact same tests. And he laid them down, one in front of me and one in front of the Asian girl next to me. Now, I'm not here to stereotype, but let's face it, the Asian kids always kicked ass in school and knew what they were doing. He walked back up, talked for a few more seconds, and then looked at his watch and said, Listen, I've got to go make a few phone calls, to which he made direct eye contact with me. He said, I'm not going to be in here for this part of the test, and I trust that all of you can be trusted to take this test and do well on your own. He smiled, nodded, turned, walked out, and shut the door. Of course, getting the message, hearing what he had to say, and knowing that he was trusting me next to this girl with the exact same test... I could only do one thing, and I began feverishly cheating off of my neighbor. (laughs) This was a gift to me from the gods. Had my rest stop savior been a part of this as well? I don't know, but I wasn't going to look a gift horse in the mouth. Funny thing was, a few weeks later, when I returned home and was settled in waiting to hear from Winona State, the envelope arrived with my test scores and the information that I was accepted to Winona State College. And there, amongst my test scores, I scanned to see what they looked like. I did well in every one of the classes and barely passed in math. By literally, I think, two or three questions. That's all I passed by. So, of course, just my luck, I sat next to the one Asian girl that couldn't do math very well. But either way, I passed that class with the help of two strangers who reached out to do a kindness for somebody that they didn't know. And I've taken that forward in my life. And I hope that you listening to the story will do the same. When you get the chance, do good things for other people. Because I can tell you, as someone who's had it happen to him, if you give with your heart and expect nothing in return, you will be showered upon with grace. Happy holidays, everyone.
beyond the darkness. This is Beyond the Darkness, and it's the spirit of the holidays. That's what we're talking about today, the old magic of Christmas, Yuletide traditions for the darkest days of the year. Linda Radish is with us talking about all of these strange and wonderful stories. Get a chance to rub elbows with veiled spirits, learn about the uh, true perils of elves we'll find out about. The 12 days of Christmas, you said something a little earlier. It sounds like this is more of a dark, creepy aspect of it than, you know, than ladies dancing and lords a leaping and partridges in a pear tree uh linda thank you again for being here today and kind of giving us a different insight into the seasons here oh thanks for having me it's uh it's fun to talk about this I, witches vampires our halloween crew our paranormal fan base here has got to absolutely be loving the ties to all of these weird things i know my daughter uh, who listens to the show regularly from Illinois is a, a fan of witches and and uh, finding out about Bafana, the Italian witch of Christmas. I'm sure is is delighting her to no end. Were you surprised to hear all of the weird creatures that are associated with this holiday? Growing up, you know, especially in a Christian environment, we've you know we were led to believe one whole series of stories. Were you surprised at all these weird aspects that have popped up? Um, like the, the first time. You know, the first ones I stumbled on, I was. Um, I actually discovered a lot of them when I was working on my first book that was about Walpurgis Nights. And that working on that book actually led me to a lot of the sources for the Christmas book. And what really surprised me, what was completely new to me, were the Bohemian traditions. The, uh, the Baborki, who come out on St. Barbara's Eve, December Third, and they're dressed. They have long wigs, sometimes made out of grass, and they they come around um, waving the carpet beaters. And they also have a Luca. That's their version of Saint Lucy, and she has a long beak, a mask with the long beak that can open and close, and would give that. Would you would usually inspect for dust? before she gave any treats out. Okay. And and what's, uh, what's the, one of the creepiest things about a lot of these characters, especially one that I discovered in, in Switzerland, which is a kind of over-the-top version of the Christ child. It's a girl who's dressed pretty much as a bride, but sort of like a bride um, in full, full veiling. You can't see her face. And a lot of these, the Luca and the Baborki, they are silent. And to me, that's one of the creepiest things. Somebody comes into your house in a strange costume, looks all around, passes out treats, and says nothing. Yeah, that is kind of chilling, especially in a veiled costume, right? Yeah, yeah. So it gives you that ethereal, ghostly look. Yeah, that's creepy. Yeah. And There's now that creepy about somebody who looks like they should talk and doesn't talk. Right now, this starts with uh, now. Is this the beginnings of the twelve days of Christmas that you're referring to? Um, what in the, the you mean the all those characters? Well, some like the one you were just mentioning because I talked about the twelve days of Christmas, and it's not what we you know we think of with lords a leaping and ladies dancing and a partridge in a pear tree and. Um, you know, how on this day of Christmas, my true love gave to me. I was just wondering if this kind of fit into that realm because you've got these different characters delivering gifts and and with these different looks. And when does the officially when does the twelve days of Christmas begin? It can. Be, it's usually December twenty fifth. Sometimes they say December twenty sixth, and then on through January sixth, which is Epiphany. That's when um, Bafana delivers her presents. That's when the three kings were supposed to have arrived in Bethlehem and presented their gifts. Okay, so well so after the days yeah. we celebrate as the birth. Okay, all right. Yeah, it's when we but we've already got the Christmas tree out of the curb, but it's still Christmas time. Gotcha. <laughs> so we should keep the tree. So I don't feel bad now for keeping the tree up till May or June. Right? I mean, I'm just following tradition. You should feel bad. You should feel bad. <laughs> and if you keep it up until, if you don't get it down by February 2nd, which is Candlemas, you will have an infestation of goblins. Yes, I do. Eight of them. 
that explains it all. Eight goblins, and I've just married into three more. So uh, you're right; oh, it is an God. infestation. You want to get rid of them? Get the get the Christmas greens down by February second. Uh, <laughs> I think I will put them or down December twenty sixth at this point. <laughs> So uh, uh-huh. l- let's in this next segment, let's start to delve into the twelve days of Christmas. Then, and what ex- what is the original genesis of this? And what obviously the song teaches us one thing, but I'm guessing it has nothing to do with uh, your true love gi- giving you gifts every day. Yeah, I don't have I don't have the, the twelve days of Christmas song in the book. I love it. Um, I have heard that it's remnants of paganism, and then I've heard it's Catholic. Um, it was sort of like a secret way of teaching the Catholic catechism when there were all those religious wars happening in England. But And, and I've seen there's been Facebook posts that map out the whole thing, and I can't remember, like seven, seven swans of swimming is the seven deadly sins, if, if that's what it was, I can't remember. But, I mean, I don't see how it could possibly, the things that you're supposed to be remembering, I don't see how the song would possibly help you remember those things because they don't seem to have any relationship to to the, the Catholic tenets that the kids are supposed to memorize. Well, what goes um, on then during the 12 days of Christmas? Putting the song aside, what are the 12 days of Christmas? And what? And I know you said they start here and they end here with the these different deals, but what is going on during each one of those days? Is there spe- special uh, type of rituals that are supposed to be taking place on each of those days? Um, yeah, there are. It's, um, like I said, when, you know, once the Winter solstice comes along, the days start to get uh, longer, so it seems like the deck is stacked in, in stack in our favor and not in the dark spirit's favor. Um, but it's dangerous again because now we're coming to the end of one year and the beginning of the next year, and when you have transition from one thing to another, there was a gap in between and that people can fall through the gaps, so you have to be you have to take certain precautions. Um, in Austria, they, they take juniper branches, burning juniper branches, put them in a bucket, and they, they smoke the cow stalls to keep witches away on these days. And, um, Iceland, it's elves moving day. That was the, the, the moving season. Okay. This was the time when it was most likely elves would decide to move from one of their farmsteads to another farmstead, so they might be passing, passing through your farm or even through your house. And but they were to be welcomed. It, they were allowed to pass through, and maybe you even put out some lights and some food for them in case they were hungry, or tired and wanted to rest for a while on the way. So things are really the twelve days of Christmas is when things are on the move. Not necessarily evil things, but things are sort of in upheaval. Because it's a transition. Everybody's sort of going through a transition. And, of course, then we have New Year's. Right. Well, let's, uh, let me bounce to one thing on, on December, Christmas Eve, uh, December 24th. There's a lot of rules I was unaware of. My, my, the only rules I knew growing up was get to bed early. Santa can't see you. You can't see Santa. If you do, the whole Christmas magic is broken. Santa won't visit anymore kind of thing. But Europeans, right. um, they're just putting up their Christmas trees starting on December 24th, right? Yeah, my mom, who grew up in Germany, um, the door to, well, they didn't really have a living room, but the door to the main room was closed late afternoon, and the parents went in there, and the kids couldn't couldn't go in, and then finally the parents would open it up, and there was a Christmas tree, all decorated, real, real candles, which they'd light when it got dark, and then usually the, the tree was on a table, and there was a white sheet under the tray that was cov- under under the tree that was covering something. And then at night, um, Santa Claus or Devi Nussman, the Christmas man, he would come and he would pull the white sheet off the presents, so then they could have the presents. And he and my, and my mother, her first time that she remembers seeing him, she screamed because and tried to crawl under the table because there was a strange man in their apartment. Really? So she got to see this. Yeah. All right. And yeah, you would, yes, you would actually see him. And then she eventually realized um, somebody said something that the, that they shouldn't have, and she realized that that the Christmas man was actually her friend's father, who lived a couple floors below them. 
<laughs> oh, really? So the the yeah the veil had been pulled back, unfortunately. Well, where do we get the idea of like leaving the treats out? Is that just in honor of? I know uh, you know in in uh, Pompeii and things they used to have house spirits that they would uh, you know yeah you know and, and in that culture they would kind of leave um, treats out for them or they would thank them and it was just kind of the the sprites the the angels the spirits whatever you wanted to call them of the house. But uh, we started putting out cookies for Santa. You'd put out carrots for uh, the the reindeer, of course. Uh, was there a, a place that that started? And is that same kind of culture shared around the world? Do they do they leave treats out for Santa and and for the um, the elves or for the, uh, the the reindeer? Yeah, they leave. Well, they. I think that that of of all the, if you can point to one Christmas tradition and say, okay, that's pagan it would be the leaving of the cookies and the milk for Santa because that one is so old. Um, and this is, I think this is just the latest version because we put it at the fireplace because of course Santa comes down the chimney. Um, but they, they do it in Spain. When the three Kings come around, they leave straw for the camels to eat. Um, and they, but they also put it, in their shoes by the, they put the straw in the shoes by the fireplace, and then the three kings leave, leave the offerings at the fireplace. Even though, as far as I know, the three kings, I mean, they're all, you know, they're kings. They're not going to go down the, the chimney. But we still have this idea that the hearth um, is the center of the home, and that's where the ancestral spirits live. And the, then they're given offerings at this time of year in, in return for blessings in the next year. So I think that's one of the oldest traditions that we have. And but but places like Greece, they don't leave cookies out for Santa. I, I like their version. They're leaving out pork sausage and sweet meats, right? Yes, for the if I can say the Kali Kansaroi, who are kind of like the early Turkish werewolves. They're they're dark and hairy. And you leave the you, you leave the pork and the candy for them in the chimney so that they will not proceed into the dining room and eat your own Christmas feast. So they'll take the offerings and go away again. And I wonder, yeah, I wonder about the pork again there, because why are you leaving pork? Is, is this was it maybe in the old days you would leave them baby? I don't know. Ooh, that's creepy, yeah. right? And then you had like that's the Yule buck. Again. You had the Yule Buck, right? Yule mm-hmm. Boar, Yule Buck, household sprites you would leave out things for. Um, yeah, you leave the porridge for the Nis, the, the, the Swedish or Norwegian or Danish um, little old little elfin old man who lives in the stables. You would leave porridge out for him. And he was probably the ghost of whoever built that farmstead whoever cleared the land and built that farmstead so your your earliest ancestor in that place weird and they would also use uh, christmas eve was big for like in lithuania for like mirror scrying right for your future love to see who might be the person you're going to end up with yeah there's a lot of fortune telling going on at this time of year because you know the whole getting to the boundary of the year the thinning of the veil and so that was when you're most likely, the spirits are going to most likely reveal what they know. And it was mostly young girls doing stuff, either, you know, rituals where you light a candle at midnight and look in the mirror, or you parade around the chimney stack uh, naked at midnight. We don't have, I, I cleaned a house, I still cleaned that house, but unfortunately he took the chimney down. There was a, one of my clients actually had a chimney stack going up through the attic. And I told him about this ritual. I said, if you want to, you can walk naked around the chimney stack <laughs> on Christmas Eve. <laughs> and maybe you will find out if at the ripe age of 52, you will get married. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, he, he, he's renovating the house and he took the chimney down. I was really disappointed. Oh, well, now he's never going to find love. Exactly. And that's actually the same client who, in an earlier house where he lived, he had a coffin door. And I talk about um, in Wales. Taking, so they would sometimes pull the corpse up out of the house through the chimney if you didn't have a coffin door, which is it's an extra door that, that you can open up if you need to take uh, take a body in a coffin out of the house. Yeah, this is 
Weird. You even have like the rising of the dead on December twentieth, right? Anybody named Thomas who died got to, in that last year yeah. got to got to come up out of the grave and go meet Saint Thomas to get their blessings and have yeah have a party. That's another Bohemian thing. They're doing all these 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 cool things in Bohemia. Um, so and and again, that would be your birthday too if you if you were you know named Thomas and you were died uh that's also your birthday you're coming out on and a lot of these saints um saint thomas saint martin the dutch saint nicholas a lot of them ride on horses they come in on horses or chariots and that may be uh that could be an echo of odin riding on his eight-legged horse because that was also the season that odin and the wild hunt were on the move on the wild hunt yeah, and the, which you're not supposed to look at. If you look at, you'll either be blinded or you'll go insane or, or you'll die. So when you hear them coming, you throw yourself on the ground and cover your face. And pretty much from December 20th all the way through New Year's Eve, that was kind of the whole time that they that these beings would haunt, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, and on, that's on fascinating. On January, January 6th. And then the, the Yule... Um, the Yule Buck, he comes in once more on January twelfth, which is Saint, January thirteenth, which is Saint Knut's Day, and um, in Finland, the Nutupuki. Pardon me, the Goat Man. Okay, the, the Nutupuki. <laughs> Sounds like a healthy Nutupuki snack. Has, um, <laughs> in uh, Finland, Santa Claus is called uh, Yulupuki, and a puki that's an old word. Um, right, like a puka, finishes, right? Exactly. Even though Finnish is in the Finno-Ugric language family, it's not Indo-European, but there's lots of loan words, and that seems to be one. Going back to the Irish puka, who was usually usually had often had horns, who would come in and clean the house. It that goes all the way back to Proto-Indo-European because there's a Sanskrit word that's related to our our well, quote unquote, our word puka. So this Nutupuki, the Nuts puki. He would uh, show up once more on St. Knut's Day, and and you're supposed to give him a beer when he comes to your door. Hey, I'll sign up for that gig. Are they are they hiring for a Nutrapuki role? I don't, I'll take it. Well, you could be the Nutrapuki. There's also all the uh, those the Houghton horses in the British Isles, where you know one person would dress up as a horse, and the other people would be his his handlers, and they would go from house to house, and you're supposed to give them something to drink there's a lot of drinking going on it sounds like there was to start this whole thing um gifts this is this is it folks christmas gift time i've got the perfect gift for you to give it's me the gift of darkness dave i was part of a great mini series called paranormal challenge i've got the entire three disc set available and uh, autographed for you it's 30 dollars for the set plus 395 shipping and handling also, copies of my book, The Other Side, A Guide to Ghost Hunting and the Paranormal. I have those available for $10, autographed three ninety five, shipped out the door to you. Or you can get both for $40 and one shipping charge of three ninety five. If you're interested, just email me, dave at darknessradio.com, and we will invoice you and get those items out the door to you as soon as we possibly can. So, again, if you're looking for a cool paranormal gift item, just contact me, dave at darknessradio.com. You can also go to darknessradio.com and click on our Killer Deals link. We've hand-selected all of the items there, including our guest's book from tonight. You'll be able to go there immediately and find The Old Magic of Christmas, Yuletide Traditions for the Darkest Days of the Year by Linda Radish. We've got that up on the site along with many of the other books you've heard us cover on our show. So go check out darknessradio.com. Click on the Killer Deals link to find clothing, ghost hunting, and Bigfoot hunting equipment, books, and more. It's all there for you at darknessradio.com under the Killer Deals link. Linda, I I love this stuff, and it's so fascinating to me, and I, I love that you've gone to all this work to dig this stuff up and bring it together in one comprehensive place for us to continue to learn and educate ourselves. Because I think this is, you know, we talked about it the other day on the show. If you can find interesting ways to educate children and tying it to the strange and unusual, what a great way to do that. You, they get to learn and, and find fascinating bits of history that will be lost, right? At our current rate, this stuff's going to be lost to the generations. Um, and, and it's people like you putting them together, creating books like this, so that they can 
find this information and find it in an entertaining way. I applaud this kind of work. So thank you for doing the stuff that you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, I wish I had had my book when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. How, how fascinating then, all this stuff again, is. I, if I hadn't had to hunt for it, maybe I wouldn't have become so obsessed with it and I wouldn't have written the book. So there's that, too. But then there's there's always more. I mean, I did not put every freaky tradition that I found in the book because there just wasn't room. And some there were some things I just, you know, were like beyond the cultural sphere that I felt I had confidence to handle. So there's always more out there. Wow. you got to come out with part two on the book. We need to have you back on for that. So when you go out well, on just... Well. I'm sorry? The next book is Elves. I'm working on a, a book for Llewellyn, and the subject is Elves. So it will well, be exclusively Elves. Well, that's what I was just going to reach in and, and ask you about, is the Elves and the Elven culture, because I know that's a big part of the, the book and some of the points on there as well. What can you tell us about Elves, and where did the uh, the beginnings of, of these fables and stories and characters begin? Well, I think the Elves have become much shrunken. If you go back to the Viking Age, like 700 A.D., um, elves were not considered tiny. They were, um, I think that's, the elves also are one of the oldest oldest beliefs that we have from pre-Christian Europe. And they were still, um, there are things called cup-marked stones in Europe, actually even beyond Europe, where people have pecked out um Little little depressions in stones where they would leave offerings, and sometimes there's also there's sun wheels on there and and figures from you know even going back to the New Stone Age to the Bronze Age. In the Bronze Age, there was a lot of ships drawn on these, and that's where the offerings were left to the elves. Um, but even into the 1800s, elves were not considered little in in the folklore of that period. They were just, they were people like us, but in a different realm. Right. Well, even Santa in the famous, uh, that poem, Twas the Night Before Christmas, he's referred to as a right jolly old elf. Jolly old elf, right, right. So they're just. Santa's a very special elf, but many of the elves were just, um, you know, like they're moving house. They're moving from one house to another on New Year's Eve, and they might get tired and hungry on the way, so leave something out for them. And they would have their own livestock and in Iceland especially they're um they're no- notorious for borrowing things if you lose something in the house um just wait a bit and it'll reappear because the elves are are using it for a while you know either an iron or a sewing machine well not a sewing machine that's too big but you a bread knife something like that I was going like to say those are those are greedy elves why do they keep taking my car keys and my TV remote <laughs> Right, right. As long as they don't take a car. <laughs> <laughs> no, they can have that. I've got insurance on that, but I can't find my keys or my my keys, my wallet, and my remote control are always vanishing. It's brutal. Yeah, stupid you elves. Ask them about. Well, be careful. Be careful, because right. actually, there's there's some some cultures where and and elves are you know ninety nine percent of the time elves are synonymous with fairies, and there's cultures like in Newfoundland where they don't say fairies. They'll say the kindly ones or the the good people. Because if you say elves, then their ears perk up and they're listening to what you say and you could get in trouble for it. Well, hope, hopefully my elves are on the Urban Dictionary and they know when I said stupid, I meant like awesome. They are stupid good. That's oh, what I, I was getting oh, at. Right, oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm getting too old to keep up with that. So. <laughs> Yeah, I Thanks. hope I now I know that. Hope I just dug myself out of an elven hole I don't need to be in. Uh, what what would happen if you didn't have treats for them or didn't let them in? Would they become unruly and and evil? Um they ha- yeah, they have come in. Um there's this there's many versions of this story where there's always somebody left alone on the Icelandic farmstead on Christmas Eve because um it takes a long time to get to and from church and somebody has to stay home and watch the sheep and be in charge. And in the one version, and it's in other parts of Scandinavia too, there's one daughter of the house or or maidservant who stays home, and while she's at home home alone reading the Bible because she's a good girl, the elves come in. And they just like look like regular people, um, 
and they they dance and they just kind of take over the house and they have their own Christmas Eve party and they invite her to dance with them, uh, which she doesn't do. She just sits there and, and reads her Bible. Sometimes she says something um, with the word God in it and they all have to disappear. Sometimes she just sits and reads and then they go off again. But if if she gets up and she dances with them, then she'll never be seen again. There are some and that's dangerous what rules. Offered that or not. Yeah, there are some dangerous rules. Yeah. Yeah. And I think some of it was like how do you how do you behave with strangers? Right, Generally, I get that. You, cre- you treat them you avoid them if at all possible. <laughs> you can't avoid them, then you treat them with the utmost courtesy because you never know what kind of powers they might have. That's true. So see, all these times I thought my dad was just being rude, avoiding strangers. It was simply he was living by the cultures of the old ways. Yeah, yeah, don't get involved, <laughs> because you ne- you just never know. <laughs> That's right. Well, let's delve into some of the realms of the ghosts. What ghosts are associated so much with the Christmas holidays and, and throughout this time? Well, I, one of my favorites is the Mistletoe Bride, who's, um, she's everywhere. She's mostly English and then into um, the Americas. And, well, her, her story's a little bit silly, it's that she she got married on Christmas Eve, usually to someone much older than she was, and she was just a teenager. And then at the wedding reception in the house, which she's always she's married a noble, and I live in a big old house. Uh, she decides it would be fun to play hide and seek, so they go play hide and seek, and but then nobody can find her. And they look and they look and they look, and nobody ever finds her until several, like a generation or more later, somebody happens to be going through old furniture in the attic and they open up a chest and there is this skeleton in full bridal regalia. And the idea is she accidentally locked herself into one of the chests and died there. And of course then, you know, when you die like that, you got to haunt, in an old English house, you got to haunt the house. Well, obviously that's the rules. And I did have in the in the an earlier draft of the manuscript, I had like a full page footnote because I, I went looking into medieval chess design and came to the conclusion that you can't lock yourself in a medieval closed chest. There, you can just reach, you either push the thing open or or spring the lock from the outside. Uh, but my editor kind of said yeah, we don't really need to know that much information. <laughs> You're a little on the OCD I, side, aren't you, Linda? <laughs> well, not the OCD side. I just like, I know, I want to know right. how, how things work, what things were made out of, what was it really like, what was really going on in this situation. But I think the reason that she's so pervasive, and I think there's even in North Carolina, you find another version of the story, is because it's Christmas time, dangerous time of year because it's the end of one year going to the into a new year so people fall through the gaps and she's a bride there's so many ghostly brides so for her it was double danger because she's a bride at christmas time when you're she's transitioning from being a child to being a grown-up from being a virgin to being a wife and so she she slips through the cracks so you really, Christmas wedding is, is not recommended. Just, it's just too dangerous. And the, the idea of ghost stories, where did that come from that we would tell ghost stories at Christmas time? That doesn't seem to go hand in hand with the whole idea. Was it so that we'd remember our past and our culture and our, our bloodlines? Or am I over-romanticizing well, it? Yeah, I, I think that could be part of I think that could be the origin of it. Like, well, you know, at, at Halloween... Um, the trick or treaters are—they're actually representing the ancestors, and we're offering, um, making offerings to the ancestors in return for their blessings. It just, you know, nowadays it's in the form of children. Um, so they're really the represent the representatives of the dead ancestors. And the same thing at Christmas—they come back there too. And there, there were um, places in Scandinavia where the whole family would sleep. On the, in the straw on the floor on Christmas Eve, they would leave the food on the table, the candles burning, 
and sleep on the straw so the, the ancestors could come in, they could eat, they could party, and then they could sleep in a comfortable bed for one night. So we have that, and then it became, and of course, you know, you tell stories about it, but you know, what, you know, what actually happened, did somebody actually see an ancestor come in, or you know, what weird things happened, and then by the time of Dickens, it was, it was entrenched as the season for telling ghost stories. And it's even in that song, The Most Wonderful Time of the Year. Right. Yeah, so it's. It, I think it's only recently, like maybe in the past 100 to 75 years, that it's no longer a tradition to tell ghost stories. So I think it's high time that we reinstate the ghost stories at Christmas time. I agree. We have just the one now. It's just a, a Christmas carol right now, but Dickens actually wrote a whole bunch of ghost stories. He came out with a new one every every December that that's when people were looking for ghost stories. Oh, really? I didn't know that that uh, that he came out with a different ghost story every December. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. Well, we might have to do some of those for a theater of the mind in the future. Linda Radish, uh, The Old Magic of Christmas, Yuletide Traditions for the Darkest Days of the Year, Vampires, Werewolves, Witches, Ghosts, Elves, Goblins, You Want It, She's Got It. The book is available. We have it up on our site if you go to Darkness Radio dot com and click on the uh, killer deals link you'll find the book you'll find all the cool books that we put up there for you linda thank you very much and we wish you and yours a very very merry christmas you too merry christmas all right guys we'll be back with you next week with supernatural news and parish here on the best in paranormal talk radio this is beyond the darkness <laughs> <laughs>